Well, good evening to each of you. I hope you left your D flat at home and brought your C sharp. So we'll sing number 535. 535 every day with Jesus. <clears throat> to 534, 534. Oh uh -huh. 
Number 552, and if you'd like to be moved and stand up, that'd be fine. 552. <laughs> Glory, hallelujah, I shall not be moved. Anchored in Jehovah, I shall not be moved. Just like a dream that's planted by the waters, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Just like a dream. That's planted by the waters, I shall not be moved. In his love abiding, I shall not be moved. And in him confiding, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the waters, I shall not be moved. I shall I shall not be moved, I shall not be, I shall not be moved, just like a tree that's planted by the waters, I shall not be moved. Though the tempest rages, I shall not be moved, on the rock of ages, I shall not be moved, just like a tree that's planted by the waters, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved, just like a dream that's planted by the waters, I shall not be moved. May we bow for prayer at this time. I'd like to ask Brother Rob Miller if he'll lead us, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Father, for the time and place that we have to come and gather tonight. We pray that our hearts and our minds would be open for you to lead and direct as you see fit. We pray for the special needs of our people here, that you might be merciful unto them. Please lead and direct in the upcoming special event in honor of your sons coming to earth for us. May Christ be glorified through them. Forgive us each of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, it's good to be able to gather with each of you tonight. If you want to open your Bible to Philippians, the third chapter. Philippians, the third chapter. We'll be there in just a moment. Just to mention a few things for our prayer. Um, Friday is the floating around town and their Christmas parade. And then Sunday, ministries, always keep all of them in your prayers. The radio broadcast, as well as the, our teachers, the lesson, the messages, all of these to be for the glory of the Lord. Always again, we mention these who are uh, displaced, unable to be with us, Sandy Adams, Charles Maston. By the way, there's an address for him on the bulletin board. If you'd like to drop him a card or a $50 bill, why... It's uh, there for you. And then, of course, Billy Davidson. So keep these in your prayers. The devil has quite a few strangleholds. He's uh, beginning to tighten in our country. Um, recently, there has been a couple of cases where that certain businesses have refused to serve certain elements in our society that uh, were completely contrary to their Christian convictions. And they wound up in court over it. Well, now, the latest one I heard was that a restaurant refused to serve a Christian group. And uh, because of their convictions against some of the immoral things that are going on, but that won't go to court. You see, uh, the court's going to fall in favor of the restaurant rather than the Christian groups. So uh, the way it works is that if you take a stand on your property, on your place, for what's right is called discrimination. But if you go to theirs or whatever, it's not called that. And so the devil has a way of just tightening the noose all the time. 
uh, to try to eliminate any um, Christian from doing what they know they should do. So God says to pray for those in authority that we might lead a quiet and a peaceable life. We certainly need God's prayer for all of the Lord's churches, all of the Lord's work, and God's help, I mean, in prayer, and then we need to pray for God's leadership in making preparation for the future. Well, in Philippians chapter 3, and just read about four verses that are here, four or five of them, it says in verse 12, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. You notice in verse 15, it talks about even have God show us if we need our mind in a more perfect way. So it's important that we evaluate our state of mind towards the Lord's work uh, that's going on in the church. And we need to ask ourselves the question, am I seeking the mindset that God would have me to have about that? In the 8th chapter of Acts, you know, we're in a very sheltered environment compared to what the Christians in the early times lived in. But in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1, it says that Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church which is, was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles, and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing, um, men, and, excuse me, hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Just think about what would be going through their minds as they would live on a daily basis, knowing that the knock on their door may not be a friendly neighbor, but it might be the group of people coming to commit them to prison. You know, um, we all have things that are worrisome to us now and then in life, but think about that a little bit. If in Lynchburg, Ohio, we knew there were a group that were going about finding every true Christian they could find to take us to prison, and just think how that would change your schedule and your outlook on your life. So we need to count the cost and see if we're willing to pay the price. Uh, you know, the scripture tells us that and tells us that we're to look unto Christ, who uh, is the author and the finisher of our faith, and for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set at the right hand of, of the throne of God, and wherefore we have not yet um, shed any blood for his name at all. So the devil is telling God, and you know the Bible says he accuses saved people day and night, day and night. He never quits. So he's telling God, all of us will cave in if circumstances are costly enough. And of course, that's what he pulled on Job. He tried to break Job's faith, and Job did not break by any means. But look at verse 4 in Acts chapter 8. Therefore, all right, their response, their mindset, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. That was their chosen mindset, that even though that people were going to prison every day, yet they were going to continue. In the 10th chapter of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 10, and there in verse 21, 
in Matthew chapter 10 and there in verse 21. The brother shall deliver up the brother to death, the father the child, the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. A disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. So the mindset that Christ set before his, his disciples is, you keep on. And no matter what comes your way, you dodge that as much as possible. You keep on. And it's because of that mindset, the gates of hell did not prevail against the Lord's work in that time. And because of that mindset that the gospel came to your doorstep. If people had not been minded this way, if they had not just been determined that we're going to keep on and we're not going to let the Lord down, why the gospel would have not reached us. It would not have come to our doorstep. There is a book written, I have some in my office, uh, that's been around for a long time, The Trail of Blood by B.H. Carroll. And he points out that the uh, true New Testament churches all down through the ages have left a trail of blood. Just like in the Old Testament, the prophets and all were persecuted. So God was with them as they made the decision to keep on. In the book of Ezra, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, uh, the book of Ezra, and there in chapter 5 and verse 5, this is a time when the work of God was under attack. But it says in Ezra 5, 5, the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews that they could not cause them to cease. So they had a mindset to keep on going, and God was with them as they made the decision to keep on. So how are we minded about doing the Lord's work here at Faith Baptist Church? You know, we have to make it real. So our reality is here. Uh, it's not at Jerusalem. It's not in some Bible story, but our reality is right here. How are we minded about doing the Lord's work here? Everything happens first in the mind. You know, we have to be minded for something in order for it to be true. I'm going to go to the book of Ruth, and that's right before the book of 1 Samuel. I'm not uh, uh, doing that for your benefit, but kind of provoking my mind where it's at. But the story of Ruth is such a great account of how God works all things together. And in the 18th verse of chapter 1, the outstanding statement there, when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. Steadfastly minded. That's what Ruth was. When you go on down into chapter 2, you will find in verse 2 that she said unto her mother-in-law, let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. Well, what was that? We all have corn fields around us. We have uh, bean fields around us. She was going to take a sack or whatever she had and walk around the edges of the field to try to find some things that had not been gathered. That was going to be how she was going to live. Doing that. Have you ever had to do that? That you had to follow one of these great big old John Deere combines around and hope that they missed some things so that you could get it, so you could have something that, to make a meal out of. None of us have had that. Well, the point is, nothing was beneath her. She didn't feel like that she was too good to do this. So she said, I'm going to do this. She was just committed to doing whatever was needed to be done. That's what she was committed to. She never had issues such as, I don't think I should do that, or that's, you know, uh, somebody else ought to do that, or um, other people might not think that I'm what I ought to be. 
She didn't have issues such as position, rank, recognition, what other people would think. It was just, this needs to be done, so I'm going to do it. That's how she was minded. And her hap, you notice in verse 3, her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz. That was God making some connections here. And, of course, when you read the rest of the story, you see how important it was that she was there in that field and that she just happened to be in the field of Boaz. So God's hand was there in her behalf. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9, it talks about how that uh, we sow and others water, but God gives the increase, and then it makes this statement that we are laborers together with God. Laborers together with God. Well, that simply means this needs to be done. I'm going to do it, and then God is with us as we, as we do it. That's what that translates to be. In the 28th chapter of Matthew in verse 19, Christ said, Go ye, therefore. And then in the latter part of verse 20, he said, I'm with you always. I'm with you always. So with that in mind, we can see how that God works through people. Now back in the, the third chapter of Philippians again in verse 13, he said, Brethren, I count not myself. I count not myself. Well, look at verse 4 in that chapter also in, verse, uh, in Philippians 3. Though I might have also have confidence in the flesh. And then in verse 7, But what things were gained to me, those I count a loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. The easiest way to get off track in doing the Lord's work is to put too much emphasis on ourself. Paul said, I count not myself. In other words, I'm counting myself out. It's not uncommon for people to just quit doing something because they didn't personally like something that happened. So counting themselves. God's work must be kept sacred above ourselves, before ourselves. So that eighth verse says, Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. God's work is to be honored, even if it means we'll be dishonored. It's still to be honored. It has to be kept sacred above ourselves, before ourselves. So how big is our God? Is he bigger than ourselves? Certainly he needs to be. Now when the chips are down, <clears throat> and that is the outlook looks bleak, and there don't seem to be any solution in sight, going back to 1 Samuel chapter 14, you know the mindset, the mindset in 1 Samuel, Samuel 14 and there in verse 6 we find this in 1 Samuel 14 and verse 6 Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor come let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised it may be that the Lord will work for us for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few Saul was with his chosen men the ones that had not deserted him, and there was about 600 of them, and they were up against an army that could not be numbered. They didn't know what to do. They were hanging out underneath a shade tree. But Jonathan said, let's see what we can do that God will honor and that he will work through us. Nobody else had that frame of mind but Jonathan. He was the only one. And so when you read the rest of that chapter, and uh, you'll find that God used him in a marvelous way 
because they let that frame of mind be in themselves. And then in Philippians, the third chapter, and there in verse 13, when he said, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Now I want to play basketball a little bit with you. Uh, you may say, well, he's really lost it, but when you think about basketball or any sport as far as that's concerned, if there is something that happens that is not perfect, you have to move on. So in basketball, and this is my advice to Coach Todd, it's the rebounds that will win the game, not the first shots. And you know the best shooters, they just have a percentage. They don't make 100% of their shots. So it's the rebounds. When the shot is missed, somebody else gets it, makes a shot, it's the rebound. The rebound that wins the game. So when a person misses a shot, the next move is to get the rebound. It's not to quit. It's not to get discouraged. It's not to badmouth the person that missed. It's to get the rebound. That's the next move. So if you get all down over a missed shot, you won't get the rebound. A coach who would remove the player who misses a shot will quickly wind up with nobody on the floor, no team at all, because everybody's going to miss a shot. Everyone will. 1 Corinthians 14, 20 says, Brethren, be not children in understanding. How be it in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. We have to be able to forget the things that are behind. We have to be able to get the rebound. In uh, Romans chapter 14 and there in verse 13, it says, let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. So think about that. <clears throat> we, we cannot stop when there is a missed shot, and then give that person down the road. We have got to make sure that from that point on, we're careful that we don't make a misstep, but that we go ahead. And one of the most valuable players is the one who steps up and gets the rebound and remains focused on what it takes to overcome no matter what has happened. In the 27th chapter of Acts, in Acts chapter 27, and there in verse 20, it says, When neither sun nor stars and many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete, and to have gained this harm and loss. Now they needed to hear that because they had totally disregarded uh, what he had told them in the beginning. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss in any man's life among you but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. The error was reproved, but more importantly, the solution was offered. The solution was offered of how to go forward. God has promised us that we can get the rebound, that we can overcome, that we can go forward. In the 20th chapter of Acts, and there in verse 29, when Paul was counseling the elders at the church at, <clears throat> at Ephesus, in Acts 20, 29, I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. 
Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And here's the important verse. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. They were going to experience trouble. You know, there's never been a church that doesn't experience trouble. They were going to experience trouble. There was going to be trouble come from the outside. There was going to be trouble rise up from within. But he said, God's grace, God's grace can build you up. But you have to be committed. You have to be committed. Like we read in uh, Philippians 3.13, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I want to inject a point in 1 uh, Kings chapter 19. In 1 Kings chapter 19, and there in verse 12 and 13. 1 Kings chapter 19, and there in verse 12 and 13. After the earthquake of fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? You know, when we're hearing the word of God, God's giving us his counsel, sometimes there'll be a little light come on in our thinking. Yeah, yeah. And then we can feel a little tug on our heart. This is the way, walk you in it. What do we do with that? You know, we can quench it or we can yield to it. And so that's what I want to inject. We hear a lot of things from God's word, but what do we do with them after we have heard them? There is a very important matter we have to resolve. Serving God is not about serving ourselves. It is about serving God. So back in our text in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12, not as though I had already attained. And then in the 13th verse, I count not myself to have apprehended. It is natural that we try to make serving God about ourselves. It's a natural thing. But as we try to do this, we become very frustrated, become very frustrated. Because when it's about ourselves, it becomes about us attaining what we want. And Paul says, no, we don't count ourselves to have attained. When it's about ourselves, it's about our apprehending what we value. And Paul says, that's not it is not to be able to count ourselves to have apprehended. That's not it at all. For example, I think every Christian would like to come to a point where we think we've got the best knowledge that there is to have. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and there in verse 1 and 2, it tells us, Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And if any man think... He knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. That can be frustrating. You know, when you think, well, I think I've got this thing nailed down, and you find out you don't have it nailed down. You don't have it nailed down. We would also like to have great strength as God's people. But over in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and there in verse 10, Paul said, therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. And here's the point. When I am weak, then am I strong. So when we try to make it about ourselves and we try to make it about what we want to attain, what we want to acquire, what we want to become, we get frustrated. Because that's not the way it is. It's not about serving ourselves. It's about serving the Lord. 
the more success-minded we become, the more we realize our personal failures. That's the way it is spiritually. You know, you might uh, really be after success and all you run into is your failures. Well, there is a, I didn't look it up, but there is a prayer out there. Uh, the guy was saying he prayed for strength. God gave him weakness. And so all of that, you know, it works the opposite. It's not about serving ourselves. It's about serving God. We cannot make our service to God about ourselves. It must always be, what does God want from me now? That's what it has to be about. What does God want? So in Philippians, the third chapter, and there in verse 12, he said, I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. And in verse 13, reaching forth, under those things which are before. And verse 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. It's never about what has happened. It's always about what needs to be done. And you know, when our spiritual life gets into position that it's about what has happened and not about what needs to be done, we're stuck. We are stuck. So we must become aware that we lose not our focus and our footing. In this 16th verse of Philippians 3, Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. You know, you don't find in there where God says change is the answer. Change is not the answer. Submission is. That's the answer. Submission, not change. God doesn't change. The truth doesn't change. Our calling and our election doesn't change. So what does change mean? Change means getting off course. That's what it means. Getting off course from what we have been on. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Be ye steadfast unmovable always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as ye know your labor is not in vain in the Lord whereto we have already attained let us walk by the same rule let us mind the same thing so think about change for a moment change means that I haven't been right in the past so I need to be converted I need to be converted from the error of my way. I need to now find God's way. Or the other side of change would mean I'm not right in making the change because I have been right in the past. Of course, we can have trouble here, and God tells us what to do about it in Philippians 3.15. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. <clears throat> Have you ever come to a place <clears throat> you really didn't know what to do? You really didn't know how things were going to work out? Well, we have a God that does. And our God has promised us he can guide us. And he can reveal unto us what we need to know. But as we started out in the beginning... Our state of mind. How are we minded about the Lord's work? May we bow our heads for prayer. Our Father, we just pray that you'll help us to see the glorious opportunity there is as a Christian in serving you. And there's no one here tonight that you do not want to have that blessing in their life. And I pray that you'll help us to know it begins in our state of mind. It begins in what we're thinking. <clears throat> it begins in what we purpose. And what a glorious opportunity it is to deny ourselves, to take up our cross and follow you, to make our service to you not about ourselves, but always about you and what you want us to be and do.
And we just pray that your spirit would speak to all of us on this subject because we know that we all need to have a refresher. We all need to have a re-energizer when it comes to your work. And you're the one that we can get that from. Bless the invitation, we pray in Jesus' name.